I get asked, what, what's BKSFS targeted at? And the answer is everything. My longstanding goal is to be reliable and robust enough to be the XFS replacement. That's something that I've been taking seriously for a long time. And it's been a few years since I've gotten to, to present, so I want to cover what's been added, what's new. We got RefLink, and then after I did RefLink, Dave Chinner messaged me and asked me, what's going on with snapshots? I thought, oh dear, I guess I, I guess I do have to do that. But then what I realized was that The reason I hadn't tackled snapshots for the longest time is that X tense and snapshots are a difficult combination, but all the, uh, some other things that I finally reworked in the way the B-tree code handles X tense meant that snapshots were now a possibility. So snapshots are now done, and they scale beautifully. I've gotten up to over a million snapshots in a test virtual machine. There is no scalability is uh, issues in FSCK, it all just works. Snapshots are basically the same, same model as ButterFS. They're sub-volumes, same external interface, and, uh, but completely different internal implementation. More recently, there's been an allocator rewrite. So the background is that Bcache, BcacheFS is descended from Bcache, where, which was kind of the, the prototype, let's get everything working, but in a minimal amount of code. And Bcache had a number of algorithmic scalability issues. It was targeted at just just being a cache when SSDs were more like 100 gigabytes. And now I've got users with BcacheFS on like 50 terabyte arrays. So things that you can you you can do things with 100 gigabytes of data that don't no longer scale at 50 terabytes. So I've been methodically, one by one, working out all the, uh, rewriting all the algorithmic stuff in the allocator. And that's now done, completely done. We've got persistent data structures to replace things where we used to have to periodically walk the world. Persistent LRU for caching, back pointers. That's like the biggest, the last big thing on my to-do list. Um, to accelerate copy GC. So copy GC now no longer has to walk the world. This is huge for like zone device support. Which is gonna be a little ways off, but that's coming. And then when is upstreaming happening? So, for upstreaming, I want to be able to not go insane and still be able to write code when that happens. So I want to work through all the, and it's not, not so much anymore about working through the to-do list because the to-do list is always expanding, but all the really big pain points are pretty much out of the way now. And my big exciting thing has been this. Now I've got a public to-do list. This is what makes me think that upstreaming is now close and I won't go insane when it happens. So I've now I've got a thing that I can point people at where there's nice clean to-do list items that are organized and it's long but it's not like gaping missing functionality. It's enhancements and stuff that is not a massive pain point. Hey, can, can you say something about uh, where and how it is being used in production? Uh, I know that it is being used in production. I don't know anything about how many sites because I never find out until I get a call, oh, at this customer's site that 
actually has been in use for two years, which I find out because when I go to look at the version that it's running. But it's been in use in production, uh, mainly in uh, video production houses for several years now, uh, where they need to be dealing with uh, multiple 4K streams uncompressed for editing multi-camera workflows. So the reason they found me was they needed something that was higher performance than ButterFS. And uh, at the time, I was the only game in town that had the feature set that they were looking for. So what do you have left? Like, uh, So I'm looking at this, right? And there's a lot of just internal vCache stuff. Mm -hmm. um, can you call out kind of, like I, I remember when we talked about this at Salt Lake City, which I know has been a while now, like it was basically, get the interface stuff right so that like, because we're not gonna review bcachefs code, we're not bcachefs developers, but like the file system guys are gonna like look at interface where you- Yeah, we were, we were talking about the IOCTL interface back then. The IOCTL interface is, is like, hasn't changed in a while. Now I'm thinking about getting the on-disk format settled down. I've still been pushing out on-disk format changes pretty regularly. Backpointers is going to be another on this format change. But after that, I don't think there's any more on the horizon. Okay. Uh, the big thing in my head has been just getting the, is I don't know about the rest of you, but I can't multitask. If I've got bugs coming in or uh, users that are trying to get up to, uh, contributors trying to get up to speed on the code, it's hard for me to do a good focused development work while juggling that having my brain state, state wiped every time I have a bug report coming in. So I've been trying to get all the deep, like, re -work, rewrite stuff done. And with back pointers getting done, it's, that's feeling really good, yeah. Okay. So what do you think, like, end of the year? Or, like, how much work do you think that you want to do internally before you talk about merging this upstream? And like, what do you want from us, right? Because like, I think that, like, like we said before, I, for merging a new file system, it's really just about like how you interface with the rest of the PFS and MM stuff. And like, well, the, the, I, from what I can tell, at least in Salt Lake City, that was pretty clean. So kind of what's, what's holding you back right now? Uh, I want to be able to, not, not go insane, well, anytime like the number of users jumps up, I'll be getting more bug reports. Sure. That's, that's the big thing that, that's holding me back. I wanna be able to actually respond to all the bug reports. And the other thing that I know from painful experience is that it's about 10 times quicker to deal with and fix a bug when I encounter it in the course of my own development on my test virtual, uh, virtual machine setup versus someone else tripping over it and then trying to work up a, a way to reproduce it. So if there's still bugs that people are gonna find, I wanna, I wanna wait and work, work through that stuff. But also, actually the other thing that I should talk about is debugging, uh, the de overall debuggability has, that's been something that I've been working on, like focusing on for the past several years. In the past six months, that's been paying off in a big way. The allocator rewrite went extremely smoothly. Uh, one tool that I should probably show off. Uh, there's a list journal tool, and this is actually, I'm gonna be talking about this more uh, tomorrow with the OM debugging se uh, session. The pretty, pretty printers that I wanna use for OM debugging came out of work in, on improving log messages in bcachefs and converting all that to common infrastructure. Stuff that I used to have to debug with a debugger, I can now just debug with grep. Well, so I think maybe along the lines Joseph was talking about, I wanna sound a lot more selfish than he does. Um, like, 
ButterFS has a bunch of warts in how we interface, in how we interface with the VFS, mm -hmm. uh, partially because our inode numbers are effectively huge, mm -hmm. uh, partially, you know, the, the reflink interfaces, the uh, compressed dioctal interfaces, stuff like that. And so I'm really excited whenever, whenever someone gets to come in and share my warts because uh, it makes us less special and it's more pressure on, you know, finding better ways to solve these problems. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think you've got pretty good context on a lot of the interface things that are awkward with ButterFS, and I was curious, you know, where we might be able to team up on that. We do have some of the same awkward, I, the inode number thing that comes up with NFS, that's also gonna be an issue with vCacheFS. So I was following that discussion. I, I didn't have bandwidth at the time to really think hard about it or come up with anything useful to say. But yeah, that when whatever solution that ButterFS uses, I, I'd like to make use of too. I, I think what happens with the inode number solution is every eight months or so, someone pops up and tells <laughs> Joseph it's stupid and easy to fix. Yeah. And then, we have to prove all over again that it is stupid but hard to fix. Yep. Um, and so uh, things like that are, what, you know, all of this stuff is really cool. I don't, don't want to diminish all the work you've done, but the part I'm most excited about is the shared problems. Like to what Chris was saying, like it's a lot easier for me to argue like, okay, ButterFS is not the only person with this problem, right? Let's change interfaces. Things like what I wanted to do for the inode number thing, which is yeah. add something to statics to like give us a better identifier, right? And like things like that when it's when it's just butterfs, like there seems to be allergic reaction to making any sort of interface change yeah. to make it easier for butterfs to better describe what it does. But if we've got two of us, <laughs> it's a lot easier. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, two things, I was just doing some quick web searches on bcachefs status, and I don't know how up-to-date some of the pages I found were, um, but uh, two things came to mind when I was looking at that. One is before you, you know, have an order of magnitude more users, I would strongly recommend that you take a look at what your FSCK repair capabilities are, because users will have hardware problems and oh, yes. if they start reaching out to you to like manually fix things. I noticed there's a page that talks about all the things FSCK checks and those things that it delegates to the kernel's B-Tree GC to check. Uh, but I didn't see anything the, about repair. <laughs> repair um, is all, all there. Okay, that's this good. This is something that, yeah, yeah, has been focused on for the past yeah. like two years. Yeah. And, that yeah, stuff out is, of sheer self-defense, that's yeah. a good thing. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is I noted that you were saying that uh, you uh, you were using a combination of XFS tests and K-tests for your testing, mm -hmm. and that at least on the page I was looking at that you didn't have an automated test runner to test all the different combinatorics of various file system configs and whatnot. Um, there are multiple file system testing rigs out there. Um, I have one, Luis has another, uh, and you know, I think both of us would be happy to work with you to get your automated testing uh, story improved. So you may want to track us down okay. uh, in the hallway track afterwards. Okay. Is there a class for that? Like tomorrow? Yeah, there's a class tomorrow for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, you, you or Joseph mentioned, and you mentioned that you wanted to add something to status, uh, statics to allow you to give a more useful inode. Right, well let's, let's talk no, I just want to, uh, this is something perhaps network file systems may be interested in as well. I just, you know. It's for you guys, it's for users facing users, but it's for you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is a whole issue. We don't need to take up Kent's slot with it, but yeah, it's, it's mostly for network file systems and also for user space, but in a less, you know, less important way, right? Because NFS, it gets ugly because you see the same inode number and that confuses things. But with, uh, at least with local file systems, you get the different div ID, so you know it's a different file system. Different, but yeah, I'll put it on the, it's really gonna screw up my like no swearing thing, but I.
So. Debugging tools is actually, and this is the thing that excites me the most, except, oh, we're not gonna do it. So, let's see if we get anything fun out of this. This is how I do a lot of my debugging these days. This your uh, pretty print thing. Yeah, yeah. So I've gotten the habit of making sure that every single type has just a generic to, te uh, to text method, and this code is shared by both user space and kernel space. So the user space list journal and like show superblock tool uses these pretty printers, the same pretty printers that I want to use for OM debugging, and because every type has this, it makes it really easy to just, in a, in a log message, just dump the, like the full keys. And then you've got something that you can grep for. So, like debugging like allocator inconsistencies where we find some free, uh, inconsistency, inconsistency in the free space p-tree. You just grep for that key through the journal and I've got in the journal annotations for transaction commit, uh, like the start of a transaction commit, including there's a start of a transaction commit. You can see what code path did that commit. And I've got a bunch more stuff in Sisyphus. I haven't had to even drop to a debugger for debugging deadlocks in a while because all my state has pretty printers that make it really easy to dump it in SysFS and debugfs. So if something gets wedged, you can find out like first where off where off where it got wedged by looking at proc pid stack. Then you know what state you're looking for, and then I can just look at like what the the journal pins are, and then backtrack that back to say the B-tree node right that got wedged. This is all information on cache B-tree nodes. This is like everything. So the state of this stuff is what, yeah, this is what I'm excited about. You might want to look at integrating some of this into Dragon. Uh, What's Dragon? So Dragon, oh, Omar's in the IO track. Uh, Dragon is Omar's uh, Python-based uh, live and after crash debugger. Um, and we use it all the time. Pretty much every investigation that we do in production involves poking around the running system with Dragon. And so you could teach Dragon your printing printing stuff, and then it can easily walk every super block and every inode and uh, all of the things you might want to look at uh, a little bit more easily than SysFS, 
I would say. Um, but still using the same infrastructure, which is obviously really good. Actually, cool. Yeah, you can you can teach Dragon like the the, fo the format, like where to find the, the the logs, and then you could even have Dragon search the logs themselves. I do this with one of the last ButterFS de dead logs that I had. Like, I just have a bunch of helpers that like, okay, I know what page is like. Go find all the locked pages, walk back, figure out where the bio was. Did the bio complete? Okay, I, the bio didn't complete. Why didn't the bio complete? And like it can walk back and find this, the, the process that submitted it and dump the stack. Oh, wow. And so like you can do all this because like so Dragon is just giving you the interface, right? You're writing Python. You like, said that's that's uh, working on crash dumps? So you can do it on live systems. Like I was using it on a live system. So it just uses proc k core to pull the, the memory contents of everything. Interesting. Like, so where does the, uh, the the code live for like parsing those data structures and dumping it textually? So that's that's what Dragon does. Like okay. Dragon like uh, reads the dwarf stuff. Uh, Omar can talk about this better than I can. It, process, it like reads the dwarf stuff. It can load the debug info stuff and process all that stuff, which is really nice. Uh. Like you'll see, <laughs> sometimes I like write random um, code to like change it defines to enums and that's so I can easily like just say enum and then the variable name because Dragon can resolve that for me and I don't have to like look up the code to find the magic number. Like Dragon just can find that what the value of that enum is. And so it's been really useful for like debugging multiple versions of kernels. Like I can find page deadlocks really quickly because I have a helper that just like finds the bit that I'm looking for for the kernel and spits out page table entries. Okay. Interesting. So it can also symbolically show you variables in the stack trace. So okay. if you're deadlocked and you know that like three functions in is uh, submit bio and you want to find out the inode that was submitting the bio, like you can just say, show me inode, the variable, and it'll work. Okay, yeah, tell me more later. So the other thing that I want to talk about, oh look, the test passed. It's always good to know. Where did my... A user manual, and it's up to about 25 pages, and it's going to be getting fleshed out a lot more. Organized by feature. So there's getting the user documentation. list, blah, blah, blah. You can tell how often I get up here and present. <laughs> Anyways. So I, like it, I understand a lot of the hesitance and the stuff, and you want to take a little longer to uh, to upstream, and I think that's reasonable, right? Um, but you know, clearly we have our own selfish reasons for wanting you wanting to upstream as soon as possible. What do you I'll only get one chance to make a good good first impression? Yeah, that's true. So like, I'm not trying to rush you, right? But I think. Um, I, I, well, I'm still kind of getting back to the like, what is your timeline, right? What? I'd like it to be within the next like six months. Based on the bug reports that I'm seeing com coming in, I think that that's probably realistic. Okay. Uh, I guess I should mention now, it, it would take about um, roughly maybe two months to create a proper baseline with high confidence. So just keep that in mind. Like I'd love to help with uh, creating a baseline for your file system uh, with high confidence. So if that helps, you know, um, just wanted to throw that out there in terms of your timeline, you know, I'd love to help with that. 
This is for testing? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk more after. When is the last rewrite? Say again, the last. When is the Rust rewrite? <laughs> There's already uh, Rust code committed. Uh, the mount tool for mounting multi-device file systems by UUID, that's written in vcacheFS. And one of the contributors has actually been working on uh, integrating that into the same binary. Uh, I haven't tried this out yet, but in theory now, we should be able to call back and forth between C and Rust, both directions. That's only in user space, but I'm, as soon as Rust lands in the kernel, I, I want to make use of that. Uh, there's, there's so many little quality of life improvements in Rust that just iterator tools, being able to write a real proper iterator instead of writing crazy for loop macros all over the place. Let's, let's all be a little bit noisier about that. Make sure it, people know that the demand is there. Well, I think that might be my half hour slot.